Hello, my name is Scott Cheatham and I'm with the Richmond Hospital Education Program. And today we're going to be looking at a lesson on a calculus concept called the power rule. Um, this power rule is a way of finding derivatives in a much easier way than using limits. It's also one of the most popular topics and um, not tricks, but strategies um, that you're going to learn and use in the calculus course. Um, so this is going to be geared towards students that are in calculus, whether it's high school calculus or AP calculus. Um, there are students that have already taken Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Trigonometry. Um, and so we're going to go over in just uh, the next slide some important pre-knowledge that we're going to assume that you feel comfortable with. Um, for today, there will be some times where I'm going to ask you to um, work out some problems. So I would suggest having some paper and a pencil. You're not really going to need a calculator today, but if you want to have access to one, that's fine. Um, but for the most part, with this lesson, you're not going to need it. So some important pre-knowledge. Um, as I mentioned, um, this is for calculus students, so it's going to be we're going to be assuming that you feel comfortable with these ideas here. Um, but one of the things that I really enjoy about teaching calculus and observing students learn calculus is that there's quite a few topics or ideas that students learn in previous years that start to really come together in calculus and, and students can see how they're going to get used. Um, for the most part, if you're taking a calculus class, I'm assuming that you're going to be wanting to go into some form of a science field um, in, in college or beyond. Um, but um, calculus also has uses um, in business um, and statistics. And so there's quite a few fields where calculus does come up. Um, we're going to talk about what a derivative is and why this rule is helpful in just a little bit. But some important pre-knowledge that we're going to, I'm going to assume that you feel comfortable utilizing. Um, the first thing being fractional exponents. Um, if you have a fractional exponent, um, that's going to be something where we're taking a radical and writing it as a fraction. Um, in that radical, we're going to have an index that is going to be um, either seen or not seen. If we don't see it, we understand that it's a square root and that the index is 2. Um, and the index is going to be the denominator of our fraction exponent. Um, if we have a um, radicand with an exponent, that becomes a numerator. So here we've got just x under the square root, that's the same as x to the 1 half. Here we have the cube root of x squared, that's the same as x to the 2 thirds. Um, we're not going to typically leave things in fractional exponents, so you might need to go the reverse direction, um, but we do want to feel comfortable going back and forth between uh, a radical and fractional exponents. Um, reducing those fractional exponents. Um, sometimes your numerator might be greater than the denominator. Um, in that case, it's almost like long division. So if we think back to elementary school, what's 5 divided by 2? Um, well, 5 divided by 2 is 2 with a remainder of 1. Um, 2 is the exponent on the term on the part of the term outside of the radical. That remainder is the leftover exponent underneath the radical. And then combining radicals, um, if we have, um, if we want to think of this as taking any radical and writing it as a fractional exponent, then we have to be comfortable with all our normal exponent rules. Here we have x squared times x to the one half. We're going to add those, um, add those uh, exponents. Um, in this case, I have it left as x to the five halves. Now, for this, um, we are going to use fractional exponents at certain times, but we are going to um, not leave our final answers with those fractional exponents. We need to rewrite it as a radical that's reduced. Um, similarly, if we have any negative exponents, um, then we need to move that um, so that we have positive exponents only. Um, we don't want to leave negative exponents in our final answer. Uh, one thing in calculus that you typically aren't going to be asked to do is to um, rationalize any denominators, meaning you can leave a square root in the denominator and that's allowed. Um, so you don't have to worry about um, moving that up as you did in Algebra 2 or Trig. Um, for the most part, you can leave a uh, radical in the denominator. So one of the foundational topics to calculus is uh, this concept of using a derivative. Um, and as you go on into calculus, you're going to find multiple ways that the derivative is used. 
Um, but basically, it comes down to slope. Um, the derivative is the slope at one point. Um, you can also think of it as the slope of a tangent line at one point. Um, but for the most part, up until now, when we think of slope, we think of, okay, well, what's the um, change in y over the change in x between two points? Um, so for here, we've got um, two points where the change in y was 24 and the change in x was 15. And our slope there is 24 over 15. And we use that to make a straight line between two points. Um, but for our derivative, we're going to be actually looking at what's the slope at just one point, which is a little bit of a harder concept to wrap your head around. Um, but that's going to present all sorts of uses for us. Um, the, the first one that you'll really get into is the derivative of, of a function at a particular point is its speed. Um, and so as you go on and on, the derivative has more and more uses in, in the real world. Um, but for now, we're going to look at, okay, well, what, what is the slope of that tangent line at one point? And the tricky part about doing it at one point is that there, there's nothing to measure. Um, you can't go between two points and find the change in y over the change in x because there really is no change in y over change in x. Um, it's 0 over 0, which is undefined. But if I took my pencil and put it as a tangent line to that point, I could see that that's, that line, depending on where the point was on the function, is going to have a, a different slope. Now, one of the uh, symbols that you'll see is delta. Um, it looks like a triangle. Um, and so delta just means that change. Um, and so we're going to kind of step back and look at the slope formula uh, here. But rather than using actual numbers, we're just going to use delta y and delta x. And that's going to help us to be able to kind of understand how we can come up with the derivative um, before we start looking at this power rule that's going to be a nice little shortcut and help us out here. So if we think to the slope formula, so th rather than treating that delta y or delta x as zero, if I just kind of think generally speaking, okay, I can, I've got a point, and then my next point is going to be the change um, in that x, and then the resulting change in y. Well, if my slope formula change in y, that's going to be my, if we think of it as like y2 minus y1, that's my new point minus my original y point. And my new point is going to be based on however that change in x that was added to the x. Now the denominator, the change in x, that's just going to be by itself. So if you look down here at this slope formula, you see f of x plus delta x minus f of x. That's really just our y's all over delta x. And so that's kind of a general formula for slope. That's what we're used to doing. It's just written a little differently. But if we make that delta x smaller and smaller and smaller, then we're going to be able to find the slope when that delta x is basically zero. Now it can't be zero because when, when it's zero, then we would have zero in the denominator, which is undefined. But if, if you think of it as a point zero, 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 one, we're going to be able to determine what that um, slope is at one particular point. But let me show you how this would look in an example um, as we kind of move forward with this. So if we got x squared, that's our function. And if we want to plug in, OK, well, x plus delta x, what would that look like um, if we took that and squared it? Um, and so you can then see here, this is what it would look like. Then we plug it into that slope formula and work it all out. And we end up with 2x plus delta x. Now, as I mentioned, I don't want you to get kind of overwhelmed with this. You're not going to be asked to do this on a regular basis, but this is where this power rule kind of comes from. And so using that slope formula with delta x, if my delta x is closer and closer and closer to 0, basically we get that the slope there would be 2x. So the derivative, or the equation for slope, at any point on the x squared function is just going to be 2x. The slope at whatever that x point is, is 2x. Now. The power rule is going to help us to calculate some of these things much easier, but the more formal definition of a derivative um, uses what we call a limit. And that limit is an idea of as something approaches something, 
it's not that it equals a number, but as we get closer and closer and closer um, to that number, what do we get there? Um, rather than using delta x, they use h um, for the same idea. Um, but basically, this is derived from the slope formula. And when you calculate it, you get the derivative, which we're going to write with a little apostrophe. Um, and it's read as f prime of x. And so um, you want to make sure that you write that um, prime symbol there. Uh, because if you forget it, then you're, you're going to be mistaken and you're, you're going to be trying to symbolize something different. So that's just kind of, I have it listed here as a warm-up, but I want to just show you how this gets used before we go over the power rule and what I want you to actually be able to do. Um, and so I'm going to kind of walk you through how this would look if you were doing it the more longer way, um, but that's typically not the way you're going to be asked to do. So our function here is x to the third, and so if I plug in x plus h, and raise that whole quantity to the third power. I've got it all here expanded and combined with my like terms, um, and then I subtract x to the third. Um, once I clean everything up, I get that all of that, when you plug into the formula, um, you get 3x squared plus 3xh plus h squared. Now, my limit, I'm when something approaches zero, basically for in a limit form, you can plug in zero for h here because we're going to basically think of it as zero. And when I do that, the zeros for the second and third term are going to cancel um, and go away. And I'm left with the derivative is 3x squared. So for the function x to the third, for that graph, for that cubic um, function, if I were to take a tangent line at any point, whatever that point is, whatever the x is, I could plug, plug in to 3x squared, and that would tell me what the slope is at that one particular point. Now for this one, x squared, a little bit less algebra to it. Um, when I have x plus h quantity squared, I get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. The x squared um, that we subtract cancels out, and then you reduce by the, dividing by that h, and you get 2x plus h. As h approaches 0, that h is going to go away, and I get my derivative is 2x. The last one here, when I plug this in, I get h over h, or just 1. And since I'm taking the limit of 1 as h approaches 0, there's nothing to plug in 0 for. So our derivative here is 1. All right. Now, as I mentioned, I wasn't asking you to plug in and use those limits. That's, that's another lesson and more complicated than what we're going to worry about today. Um, but I just want you to look at these derivatives compared to the original functions. Just take a second and look at them and see, do you notice a pattern? And if you did notice a pattern, what would you expect the derivative of x to the fourth would be without having to plug it back in? And if you uh, guessed that it would be 4x to the third, you'd be correct. And if you look at this, you notice that you have your original function, whatever the exponent is, becomes the coefficient in front. And then the resulting exponent of the derivative gets subtracted by 1. And this is going to be helpful for us because if we always use that limit definition, x plus h to the fourth power is quite a bit of algebra. And so we don't want to have to mess with that. Um, this power rule is going to be very helpful for us because we don't have to go through that limit. What the power rule states is if you have a function, x to the n, we're going to take that n. It's going to become our coefficient. And then we're going to reduce our exponent by 1. So if you haven't copied that down, go ahead and copy down that power rule because we're going to use it there for these next couple examples. All 
All right, so go ahead and give these um, four a try. I want you to copy them down and use the power rule to decide, okay, what would the derivative be for these four functions? So go ahead and copy them down, pause the presentation um, here, and then come back after you have these four answers and we'll talk about the results. All right, for this first one here, it was 7x to the sixth. So the seven um, just comes in front and becomes the coefficient, and then we reduce our exponent by one. That is much easier than plugging in and figuring out what x plus h to the seventh power is and trying to reduce it and then plugging in the limit. Um, this power rule is going to save us quite a bit of time in being able to find the derivative and be able to find what the slope would be at, at any particular point. Now for two, sometimes you have a constant uh, a coefficient already in front of the term. And when that's the case, um, the, the exponent you bring down, you're going to multiply. So four, you bring that down, you're going to multiply four times two. We still subtract the exponent by one. And here we got eight x to the third. With this next one, we get three x to the fifth. And that 6 we're going to bring down, and so really it would be 6x to the 5th all over 2. That 6 divided by 2 is going to reduce down to R3. Now for this one, we're going to bring down the negative 3, so negative 3, and we're going to subtract our exponent by 1. Now this sometimes gives people a little hard time, because when you're subtracting by 1 and it's already negative, we're actually going to go down farther. So we get 3x or negative 3x raised to the negative.